When I hear a long presentation, a long CV written, I remember when I was with John Kerry at the UN General Assembly and we were introduced with a long CV. He said, yes, the strange thing is everybody is asking, what are you going to do now, afterwards? <laughs> and uh, and, <laughs> and I'm, I'm actually a pensioner now from the Danish parliament after 38 years there. I'm very uh, pleased to be able to speak to you here today uh, on the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was a unique, unexpected revolution. Uh, those who say they predicted it are liars. We knew that a lot of things were happening over there in the GDR. I sat at a cafe in, in Kurfürstendamm three weeks before the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the uh, illuminating paper on the other side of the street said 120,000 people in Leipzig. Erik G. in Altersheim. Erik Honecker go to an old age home. So we knew that a lot of things were moving over there in the east. And thanks to the very fact, and I think another speaker this morning mentioned it, that it became clear for the peoples of East Germany and Eastern Europe that the Soviet tanks would not roll once again. It all evaporated suddenly with the fall of the wall, with the hundreds and thousands of people in Prague uh, with their keys in their hands the communist rulers just disappeared. Of course, it was also due to the uh, efforts of statesmen like Helmut Kohl, Willy Brandt, Havel and Dubček in Czechoslovakia, uh, uh, Horn and Nemeth in Hungary, uh, Lech Walesa and Adam Miska and other people in Poland. But this was a defining time in my life and in everybody else in this room, uh, in their life. At, th at the time of the fall of the wall, uh, the European Union was already a historic innovation that has been, had been crucial for a very long time of peace and prosperity uh, in Western Europe. For us in the old member states of the European Union, there was an understanding of the need the necessity of a very quick in enlargement of the Union as the best guarantee, we thought, for the maintenance and establishing of democracy in Central and Eastern Europe. And that's why under the leadership of, of um, uh, my boss at the time, the Prime Minister of Denmark, when I was Finance Minister, uh, in 1993 in Copenhagen, the criteria for membership for East and Central Europe were very well defined in the so-called Copenhagen Declaration about freedom, uh, democracy, freedom of expression, of information, independent judiciary, and so on. Uh, of course, for the new democracies in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the uh, perspective of membership was connected with huge expectations uh, and of course also the importance of an important of, of, of a, a, a huge transfer of resources from the western part of Europe. What we have seen in the past 30 years is that there were more challenges than could be predicted three years ago. We actually made a rapid process to integrate very different societies and unequal economies. The common currency in Europe was a political project from the outset, uh, and uh, the uh, difficulties that has been around it in the past years, of course, ha have to do with the problems every economist could have told you before uh, a unitary monetary policy without uh, a, a common finance policy. And 
and very big differences in economic competitiveness in the different countries inside uh, that uh, common currency. The uh, freedom of movement in an enlarged European Union uh, has also been reason for problems that was not totally foreseen. In the West, we have experienced pressure down on wage levels, social dumping, as it, as it has been uh, named, and even for that reason also, uh, in, in some quarters, xenophobia towards people coming from the East. But in the East also, it has been the uh, reason for a, an immense main, uh, brain drain from e uh, Eastern European countries. Uh, this could have been less problematic if it wasn't for the financial crisis that happened from 2008 onwards and decreased the general level of employment. After that, it was also made a major problem a, 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 a greater problem uh, because of what I would call the German-led austerity policy inside the European Union. Low growth and recession, particularly in eastern countries and southern member countries of the European Union, accelerated the brain drain, not only from the east, but, but also from the south, in Greece, in Portugal, Spain, Italy, uh, to other regions of the world. And uh, actually, I have to admit, I agree with my old friend and colleague as foreign minister in Germany, uh, Joska Fischer, when he said about the, the uh, austerity policy of uh, the anti-inflationary policy of Mrs. Merkel, the following, not quite exactly a citation, but the content of it was, well, Mrs. Merkel, our problem of this century is not in any way a new hyperinflation is uh, on the horizon like it was in Germany in the 1920s. It's much more uh, uh, credible to fear for a deflation uh, because of the policy we are following. And uh, I remember, he said, that in 1930 there was a chancellor in Germany named Heinrich Brüning who answered the uh, world economic crisis by cutting down social welfare and public em employment. What we did we get from that? Not that I think my friend Rogoska will ever thought it would be as bad as it became in the 1930s, but, but much of the turmoil and political extremism we actually experience in nowadays Europe has to do also with this kind of economic policy. In Eastern Europe, of course, also we have seen uh, a discontent connected with the fact that means of production, if they ever uh, existed and were competitive, were taken over by Western multinationals and local oligarchs, and corruption of the political system was uh, speeded up through that development in the ownership and very unequal distribution of resources. It's important to remember that this was not only happening in Russia, it was also happening to a certain degree in many parts of Eastern Europe. Uh, austerity and popu popular animosity to anything looking like socialism broke down social security structures and increased uh, even more inequality and discontent and has, has been connected also with the inability of the European Union dealing with tax fraud and tax havens, undermining the taxation of rich people and rich companies, and in recent days also the discontent, uh, 
I understand very well, with the weakness of European Union and national governments to act against climate change. Uh, this has been, of course, uh, also speeded up uh, by the uh, uncontrolled migration we have seen uh, from, from outside. Uh, we have seen uh, the waves of refugees. We have seen uh, the, uh, the uh, unregulated illegal uh, migration from Africa which has created also uncertainty, uh, discontent in many parts of the European uh, Union. And extremely enforced uh, by nationalist, anti-European media and social media manipulation. I would, for the, the case of provocation to this audience, say that the, most, the two most catastrophic outcomes of Western democracies in the past four years Brexit and Donald Trump would not have happened without Robert Murdoch and Vladimir Putin. And that, of course, uh, is pointing to the weaknesses of European democracy. All the discontent for real reasons, all the campaigning uh, and manipulation in uh, the written media, in television, in uh, social media, uh, added up to uh, the, uh, the uh, new extremism we see around in Europe. It all went against the European project, and it went against the old supporting pillars of the center left and center right. My party friends, the Social Democrats, were suffering the most from being rather dominating in the 1990s to a huge defeat in the West and no real start in the East. Instead, we'll see the search for conservative, reactionary, religious-inspired, and authoritarian politicians. And it has been interesting and frightening to see latest the local elections and the former GDR uh, which is much, has much to do, as far as I understand it, with the fact that those who are left back in those provinces are the underprivileged, are the aging left behind when the young and well-educated went <coughs> western. So what we have seen is there was no guarantee embodied in the Copenhagen criteria from 1993 uh, for uh, against member states going rock on the democratic principles. We see that in Poland, we see that in Hungary, we see that to a certain degree in the Czech Republic, in Slovakia, and Romania. And we didn't make the necessary, we didn't create the necessary tools to react to that, to maintain the European Union as a purely democratic unity. Because we can only sanction according to the, to the uh, treaties if only one country is on spot, but there are more countries. Well, uh, this is a very, uh, I, I haven't said all this in order to say nothing is good. It has been huge steps forward for a lot of people in Europe that the, the wall fall down. But what we are facing now is threats to democracy in many parts of Europe and it's a, a threat against the European cooperation, as of course we've seen it, I've talked about it several times during these days uh, in Brexit. And that is happening in spite of that it is more evident than ever with Trump, with Putin, with rising China, with India, that no European nation, whatever their size and uh, strength is strong enough to defend our common interests and common values alone. This is a continent of an aging and declining population and the declining share of the global economy. Uh, 
this is not strange to understand. Not that strange to understand for most people in small countries in Europe. We have experienced in two Danish elections this summer that we were the country that kicked most Euro uh, European, uh, non, uh, European uh, uh, opponents to Europe out of the European Parliament. We were the country that kicked most populist representatives out of the National Parliament. That goes somewhat against the trend, but I hope we're beginning of a new trend. Uh, but, but, but if it should be that, it should be that we all understand that the old concept of national sovereignty is not that much worth any longer. And for a small country like Denmark, sovereignty in the past meant that we lost provinces to the stronger Sweden, that we lost Norway to Sweden, that we lost Schleswig-Holstein to Germany, and was finally occupied by Nazi Germany. That was sovereignty. That was when we were totally sovereign, we thought. What we got when we joined the European Union was for the first time in our history an organized democratic influence of the major neighbors that used to rule over us. But I think that even the major European countries have to understand that in the world of, of Trump and Putin and China and so on, they are in much of the same situation. But in order to get people to understand this, and that's really, oh, some of my final remarks here, uh, we must also be aware that we can only popularize the project of Europe when we overcome the paralyzing, the inability to act, act against inequality, rebuilding welfare, employment, rebuilding tax systems, overcoming tax fraud, fight against social dumping, and for climate action, for sustainability, and protection of the outside borders. So there is a, a lot to be picked up if we should, so to say, underpin the fundaments of a new and better European cooperation and the fundaments of democ a common democracy as we defined it in the Copenhagen criteria of 1993. Thank you very much.